All right, thanks for logging on to 12news.com, 12 Sports Insider, Doug Franz, host of the Doug Franz Unplugged podcast. You can now catch him on TV. Isn't that right, Doug? I'm on WTSMTV.com from 8 to 10 every weekday morning. There you go, my friend. Now, uh, this whole thing with Terry McDonough and the Cardinals, you know, we, we talked about it when it came out, Doug, with very serious allegations by a former Cardinals executive accusing the Cardinals owner, Michael Bidwell, of cheating workplace misconduct. We all remember the Cardinals statement that they fired back at him. It was like taking a flamethrower to Terry McDonough's character. You wonder why they kept him on staff for so long. Finally, we are hearing point blank from Terry McDonough and he talked to you. <laughs> well, it was it was a shock because here's the reason why it's so funny to me, Cam. Honest to goodness, I got very little information out of him when he was a member of the Cardinals. There were countless number of times pre-draft I would try to get stuff from him, and he would say he would send me a text back, Doug. Love listening to the show. Hope hopefully everything's great. If you need me for anything, feel free to contact Mark Dalton of Media Relations, and that would be it. And I wouldn't get anything. Now after the draft, he might tell me about a guy that he likes and talk about players that they've drafted but never actual inside information so i was shocked when i actually heard from him and i was just sitting at a rattlers game saturday night i had texted him two weeks earlier and once the story broke i said hey if there's anything you want to say i'd be glad to talk to you about it and of course yes i'm asking you to come on my podcast and i didn't hear anything back and then all of a sudden he texts me this one sentence and it simply says Pray for Bidwill, because when the truth comes out, he's going to need all the prayers he can get. And I was like, wait a minute, well, where did this come from? And I texted him back, and that's when we engaged in a conversation. And I think the most shocking thing he said to me wasn't any of the allegations. It's when he wrote one sentence on one small text that said, and all of this is on the record with the capital O, capital N. And I'm thinking, what do I do with this? <laughs> Doug, what was what'd you learn from Terry? I would say my number one takeaway is is really just how 100% convicted he is in his own truth and his own belief in what he saw, how he felt, and what he thought was wrong at the time. And he has said in his series of texts to me, one of them says, this isn't about me. It's about the people that I saw get berated in the office, and specifically Steve Wilkes. He went very, very strongly to me on the character of Steve Wilkes and said it's going to be an even more explosive situation when Steve Wilkes speaks his mind. And, Cam, that's where the story gets a little deep because right now it's only an arbitration thing held in front of Roger Goodell when we're talking about Terry McDonough. The Steve Wilkes is part of the lawsuit of Brian Flores and the Miami Dolphins and the entire NFL. That one is supposed to go in front of Roger Goodell, the arbitrator, but that's in a court to try to prove that they should break the clause in the contract with Brian Flores, and that should go to a court of law because of the inherent bias of Roger Goodell. So that case was already interesting to Cardinals fans because Steve Wilkes had joined in the lawsuit, but now... When you back that up with the comments of Terry McDonough, it seems like that is the nail in the coffin if we hear directly from Steve Wilkes. Now, take us through the conversation. What did you say back to him? How did it go? And then he's he's doubling down on his, on his original uh, claim against the Cardinals and owner Michael Bidwell, right? Oh, ab absolutely. Um, let me give it to you. So I, I don't want to read the whole thing only because I think it'll bore people if I if I just sat here and act like we're in second grade reading class. But the thing that grabbed me is the first text back to me about asking him to come on is he said, who is this? <laughs> I'm thinking, wait, we've been texting each other for years. Why are you saying that? And I didn't understand that phrase. But then the reason why I believe him is he started talking to me before he knew, remembered what my number was. Cause I've had plenty of people, I don't know about you where I've lost their number and I see there's a text exchange, but I don't even know who it is. And then in the part before he knew who it was that he was communicating with, he said, if you know me, then you know, I'm not lying about this. This was never about me. Someone had to put a stop to Bidwell's cruel treatment of people. And when I started to see how he was trying to treat me, I knew it was time to speak up against 
against him and for all the people he thought he could bully because he owned the team. And then he mentioned that he's got a 29 page petition that includes everything. And he says that is factual and I'm going to prove it. And then he says, just remind me who you are. So, I mean, that that kind of proves it. Like, why would you be that forthcoming if you didn't know if the person on the other end was trustworthy? And I wrote, hey, it's Doug Franz from formerly of Doug and Wolf. I now do a daily podcast. And that's when he unloaded and actually said, this is all 100% on the on the uh, on the record. Did he, and uh, did he respond to the cardinal state? That, he that, did. That, he that, did that, in a way, and it and he what he said to the to that was specifically about um, the BS that's been made up about me. He did actually say the initials BS that's been made up about me. "Quote: I have the proof about him raging at pregnant ladies and other minorities." Doug, if anyone knows my honor, it's you, because look how many times you tried to get me to speak over the years and I wouldn't do it because I was honoring my commitment to my team. I stayed in my lane and I did what I was supposed to do, which is my job. And he's right, Cam. I was after him for years to get me information and he wasn't interested. Doug, what comes of all of this? What's next? That is the fantastic question, because as much as I believe Terry or uh, Terry McDonough, you have to understand, unless this rises to an unbelievable level, you have to go above the Daniel Snyder level. I mean, look how patient the NFL has been or cover up, depending on how you want to look at it, with Daniel Snyder. And this man has supposedly can do no wrong and only finally now are we close to getting rid of Daniel Snyder? We're talking about a Michael Bidwell who among the other owners is respected and is close with Roger Goodell. And yet Roger Goodell is going to hear the hearing. That's going to be awfully hard for me to believe that Roger Goodell is going to remove his own bias, listen to the facts of the case, and then decide to remove Michael Bidwell. Now, what did we learn in the Robert Sarver situation? If the information that Terry McDonough has is so damning that corporate America can't stand hearing what they're about to hear, then the pressure would be too much for Michael Bidwill to stay. And then I don't know what would happen because I just don't see a scenario where the Bidwills as a family lose the Cardinals, but maybe Michael's no longer president. But that's that seems to be a little bit further down the road. Doug, the biggest thing is when we saw with Robert Sarver, the NBA interviewed hundreds of people, hundreds of people, brought a force here to Phoenix for a while. The NFL would have to launch an investigation. It would have to go past this upcoming meeting with Roger Goodell, and they would have to speak with a bunch of people. And in the end for Robert, it was because the NBA was able to corroborate so many of the stories that were alleged to Robert Sarver in the first place. The NFL would have to do the same with Michael Bidwell. Here's the thing with what you're describing out of everything you just described. Remember, what did it do? All it did was give Robert Sarver a one year suspension. That's all Robert got. Yeah. It was the corporation. They didn't. Force it they didn't yes. Force it, it was the PayPal's of the world. It was the negative attention. Now, the league was certainly ready to do whatever it takes to get him out, but they gave him only a one year suspension and hoped the outcome would come to this. With Michael Bidwell, I don't see any scenario where the NFL forces him to sell. And I go back to the Daniel Snyder situation. Roger Goodell didn't even want a written report. He claims so he could protect the innocent so they would be able to speak freely. But in the report that you mentioned, it was a law firm that investigated, redacted the names, but went unbelievably deep. And the NBA was incredibly fair to us, the public, by sharing some most of the details of that. I just don't trust the NFL enough, Cam, to believe that they would do as exhaustive of an investigation and be willing enough to share it with the public unless we already are ready for this situation as a general public and we're on top of it to begin with so we don't get treated like we did with the Washington scandal. Do you think this becomes anything more as a he said, he said? Because right now you have two guys at the top of the Cardinals organization that are just firing shots at one another. Both say they have evidence to prove. Do you see it happening, this playing out, anything more than just that? I do see it playing out stronger than that, and here would be why. 
what the Cardinals have is proof that Terry McDonough is human and may or may not have done things that the rest of us question character wise. Terry McDonough is claiming that he has something to do. He did, I haven't heard him say, I've got the burner phone, but we've heard reports that he has specific proof that Michael Bidwill was cheating. He has specific proof of what was done to treat Steve Wilkes in such a way that he calls heinous. He says he has specific proof for how pregnant women had been treated by Michael Bidwill in the office. So then that becomes a question of what is the proof? Proof that somebody may or may not be the quite the person they pretend to be. Okay, we can decide how we feel about Terry McDonough. But if there's actual proof that Michael Bidwill was doing things against the NFL rules, how do you just shove that under uh, the rug? I think there will be more than a he said, he said when this is done. And the, the Cardinals' perception right now, he's got to call it like we see it. It's just in the tank. I mean, the team is tanking. Clearly, they're rebuilding. They can phrase it however they want to. Um, I appreciate Jonathan Gannon's positivity. Uh, but the roster, the way you look at it, you know what they're lining up for. They're lining up for down the road. That's the only reason you trade D Hop. Is is there a point, Doug, in any of this where the Cardinals change? <laughs> yeah, I mean, wow. It just seems like there's just so much. How did they follow up last year and everything that went wrong and the bad drama and everything, the laundry list of things that that organization went to by having another offseason full of chaos? Well, think about it. We've had plenty of people that we thought were scapegoats, whether it was Steve Keim, whether it was Steve Wilkes, whether it was Cliff Kingsbury, it, it, whether, whether it was uh, any, any quarterback that, that we didn't like. It didn't matter who it was or who was at fault. And for some reason, we would kind of cursory mention Michael Bidwell, but now there's only one kingpin here. There's only one guy that's been on top of this the whole time. And when you look at that and juxtapose that with some of the comments that were released by Ron Miniger in that letter, when the former COO is explaining of who the person Michael Bidwell used to be, and in his mind, who he is now, when it, you it, ask it me down on the report card in a way, and of what Terry McDonough was kind of saying. Yes. And that's the thing going to your question. When you tell me, you know, do I see the end? Uh, uh, negatively, I don't see the end because I, I don't know how this gets better unless Michael Bidwell totally comes clean and says, you know what? I I'm not a good owner and I'm going to find out how to be one because that's where we are. You can't have this much chaos in an organization with a good owner. It's impossible. Bad things happen to good owners, but they get fixed, and then you're able to move forward and rebuild a successful product quickly. Look how long this stretch has gone of complete ineptitude that we weren't sure who was at fault. Now we know. Yeah. Any chance you see Michael Bidwell taking a step back? Because clearly – I, I don't know if that's what's going to come out of all this or what's going to happen in the end, but it just feels like there needs to be more voices in that room. Mm, it's a great question. And here's the thing. Is Michael Bidwill truly a former federal prosecutor, a guy that's wanted to be in charge every second of his life, ever going to actually say, I'm not good at what I thought I was good at? There's not a lot of people that have the ability to do that. And I've never seen Michael Bidwill with that ability to do it. And I've never had a beer with him. So I don't want to act like we're friends. And certainly after he sees this, he'll decide we're not friends. Okay. And to be fair to Michael Bidwill, he's donated a lot of money to the Catholic Church and to other churches charities and so from that standpoint there are there it's kind of like the old line of star wars there is good in him but the problem is when it comes to running a franchise he's proven in the last few years that this is not something he's good at he either needs to change or he needs to put somebody else in charge and be owner but not president i think that's the one thing important that you said doug is that there have been two folds of this one michael bidwell has had to account for some things his father didn't do and had to, had to do a lot of changing in some ways that we've seen. Treating players, facilities and all that, the stadium, upgrades, taking care of fans. We've seen part of that. But clearly what we haven't seen is things other organizations do a lot better. The Cardinals are way behind in that. 
I really focus on, listen, a lot of people think that that report from the Players Association was cheesy and bogus, but here's how I look at it. Whenever 31 teams are doing it one way and you're doing it another, you either have multiple Super Bowl rings to prove you right or you change. And, and the idea that, listen, I don't think, Cam, a bunch of millionaires should whine because they have to pay for their dinner, okay? I don't, that doesn't bother me that you have to pay for your dinner. But if 31 other teams say, yeah. we're going to make you dinner, then that's the standard. And it is the definition of being cheap or at least a lack of desire of winning if you're not ready to keep up. Biggest thing too, Doug, the Cardinals way is not, it is not delivered what this Valley deserves. And that's a Super Bowl title at some point. And the stretches of gaps where this team has not been productive or they've been looking for the future have been long. And this stretch is, is going there. Everybody can point to a couple of years ago when that offense was number one and they were this and they were that. And they got to the playoffs. But the fact of the matter is they are who they are. And recently, all it's been is a drama-filled football team that fans have had to put up with. The New Jerseys are nice. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is this team and this organization have underperformed. Well, even the New Jerseys. I mean, fans have been screaming for them for, what, five years, seven years? And now you react. Oh, okay. That's a little slow. And I'll even go to look how smart Cardinals fans are. Do you sense a lot of people really upset at Buda Baker? I mean, of course there are some. But don't you get more of a feeling of, of fans being like, yeah, I understand. We're, it's almost like they look at our team and say, we're not good enough for you, Buddha. I hope you go find what you're looking for. That's what it feels like because all of us do not question as fans that Buddha Baker will give everything he has to his organization. And we all question whether or not his organization is giving their all to us and him. So I think he's exonerated. We all act like, you know what? Go ahead, abdicate your throne as leader of the Cardinals, and good luck to you because you've earned the right to leave us. This is turning into a late-night podcast. Doug, we'll get you out here on this. The <laughs> Buddha situation is, is interesting. Um, I don't understand it because if Buddha doesn't deserve a raise on that team, like, who does? To me, mm -hmm. he's the only player, one of the few players in that locker room that tried to help hold everybody accountable last year that tried to get people to raise to his level of things. I get it. There is a new GM, a new head coach in town. Clearly the moves that they've made this offseason are to get people out and bring their own people in moving forward down mm -hmm. the road through this draft and through next draft. You got to refill the cover at some point. We're going to start seeing that hopefully in this draft and next draft when Monty Asipur starts bringing in his guys. There are just some things organizations need to do to appease everybody in there, to show, like, we got this. Kelvin Beecham, I talked to him recently, and he said the reason he believes this is not going to be a rebuild and that the Cardinals are turning a corner and can move on from all the drama and everything last year is that because Monty Ossenford is putting in procedures and processes in place that allow everyone to kind of do their jobs. And you know exactly who to go to to talk to about things, to do things. I think it would be incredibly the wrong direction and send the wrong message if a guy like Buddha is unhappy and you have to trade him in any shorter way. Number one, I saw the Cam Cox, Kelvin Beach in part. Well done. Number two, Kelvin will never say anything just to toe a line. So if he says it, believe it. But I look at the Buddha Baker situation and say, I, I think Buddha is looking at it a little differently. I think Buddha is saying, I want a tank tax. I don't think he would be asking for a raise if this team was good. I think he's saying, you know what? If you're going to make me go through this rebuild and you're going to make me spend two years as a loser, then I want paid to be the leader of losers until we get up to where we were. You're making me abuse my body when I don't have the reason to play, which I play to win. So he wants a tank tax. You make me, you make me play for a tanking organization, then you owe me money for it. I stand with him. Normally I'm against players who sign a contract and then suddenly in the middle of the contract have a problem with with the very contract they signed. But the organization changed around Buda Baker. The focus changed around Buda Baker. The commitment to winning changed around Buda Baker. So now Buda Baker expects it to change for him too. And I stand with him. Two years left on his deal, no guaranteed money. 
if they extend it, that kind of makes sense. You get through this year, which mm-hmm. let's be honest, I, I get it. No professional athletes go into a season and think we're going to lose. We're going to, you know, that, that's not a mindset. You can't have that mindset on the field. But when you look at the roster that they put together and the unknowns with Tyler Murray's injury, winning would be a bonus this year. Right. If everything else, winning is a bonus this next year. And always remember, when you trade people like Paul Goldschmidt, you end up standing around wondering, where is your next Paul Goldschmidt? And you know what? The D-backs still haven't found their next Paul Goldschmidt. And I don't think the Cardinals are going to find their next Buddha. There is still nobody in that line. They're better, Doug, but there's still nobody in that lineup that anybody fears in the National League. They're good Mm -hmm. hitters, but there's no one in that lineup that strikes fear in people like Paul Goldschmidt did. And who knows when they'll find that next guy. Doug, as always, thanks for the time, buddy. Hey, anytime you need something, Cam, the best. And my best to everybody there at 12 Sports. Appreciate it.